My name is David Barzilai. I'm a medical doctor. I have a PhD in health services research, and I'm a diplomat of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. I combine these for various roles from um, the evidence-based medicine side to lifestyle medicine, which is like diet, nutrition, exercise, with aging biology. Basically, my clients in longevity consulting and longevity medicine, they're interested in evidence-based best practices around health span or healthy aging. So I apply that science, and I think it's something that more doctors should be familiar with. What's the difference between longevity medicine and medicine as it's commonly practiced now? Well, the problem is that medicine as it's practiced today, it does incorporate some prevention, but not nearly as much as we need. About 80% of chronic disease are preventable through simple things like diet, exercise, good sleep, and optimal just medical management, things like being up to date with your screenings. And most doctors try to put their best efforts to do that as well as possible, but there are a couple challenges. One challenge is from the therapeutic side. Um, I should say from the time side, actually. The amount of time you have to spend with a patient is so short. A lot of it is spent sort of putting out fires, catching someone's diagnosis of diabetes late in the game rather than maybe falling in earlier to see if the blood glucose is, is rising or giving nutritional advice and discussion to try to even avoid that situation in the first place. So that's a barrier, and I'd say the other barrier is there's very little understanding for most doctors of the biology of aging and potential for early, um, a kind of a more proactive approach based on aging biology. Mm -hmm. And have you seen results from your practice that you think are uh, significantly different from the standard of care? Um, what I would say is the practice is mostly spent on optimizing what is already the standard of care that we could be doing more in mass. So the gap between, for example, the population that follows only one health habit versus the most, it's about a 20 year difference in lifespan and about a, a 10 to 15 year difference in health span or just being disease free, being healthy and vibrant. So a lot of it concentrates in where we have the real greatest pillar of evidence, which is optimal lifestyle practices. That and being proactive about things like early diagnosis through things like annual or regular screening from MRIs to laboratory uh, to sort of tracking biomarkers of health, which can be simple things like how winded you are after certain routine exercise. Beyond that, there are other things that can be done. For example, uh, things that I would like to become the standard of care, they're not yet the standard of care. There, You can do things like get a whole genome analysis and understand what makes your biology different than other people's biology. You might have certain weaknesses that might be better complemented by things. And likewise, you might have certain th uh, strengths that may affect what the optimal health span regimen is for you. So I would say it incorporates the best practices more uniformly and then looks at a few things that have intermediate levels of evidence. But if you're looking to do more and you're making an educated decision, you could do more kind of high tech solutions too, if you're interested. And what are the most high impact interventions that you generally prescribe to your clients? I think the most high impact prescription is uh, exercise prescription, the uh, dietary prescription, um, a whole foods based diet, having a good body composition, including your muscle mass, your functional markers, such as your aerobic capacity or how essentially how well your body is able to extract oxygen when you work out, which, you know, when they do that treadmill test. So that's foundation. A lot of my clients are those that are already close to maxed out on those areas. And as a subspecialty in longevity medicine and longevity science, um, I basically help them get that extra incremental forward, as well as become aware of some of these things beyond what you might traditionally encounter in a physician office. That and the other thing is being more comprehensive. Like I believe it should be like a, just a regular standard to check people's B12 level across the board. It's cheap, a lot of people are deficient. There are people with diets you would think it would be adequate. It's still not adequate. So there's some biomarkers by being a little more comprehensive. We can just achieve more to make sure we're not missing anything important. Mm -hmm. 
And where do you see the field going over the next five, 10 years? Well, I see it moving more towards, and this is one of my, my interests, uh, I, something that I, I speak to. I'm, I'm faculty at a newly created Geneva College of Longevity Science. They have an executive master of science there. And it's this concept of precision medicine. Precision medicine needs more tools, and that's why conferences like this on the biology of aging are so instrumental, because it's by validating biomarkers of aging you're able to validate whether longevity or health extending intervention works. And also you're able to then do that precision medicine. So what is that precision medicine that I think is the future? Precision medicine basically means personalized medicine that's unique to you, unique to your goals, your time horizon, but in particular, what are your genes, what is your lifestyle, and what are your concerns, what's your family history. So these biomarkers that are being validated at this conference will, uh, are increasingly helping physicians to be able to track health progress over time. So you can tell not just what interventions might be most promising, which we talked about before, maybe based on your, your, your you know, genetic background, but also how is it working? Uh, so you can adjust and pivot as you need to, depending on how one intervention is working or another. And it also gives us valuable feedback in terms of who might benefit most. For example, uh, while still ongoing in terms of the level of validation, we're getting better and better being able to say not just how old someone is biologically, but their biologic, beyond biologic aging acceleration, it's uh, the rate at which their biologic aging is increasing. So if you can look at that across different organs, both of those things, you can say, hey, you know, your heart's doing pretty good, but your kidneys here, it's at the 20th percentile. So it lets you think about both diagnostically and therapeutically next steps that might particularly suit you. So if there was only one biomarker that you could be testing for or evaluating in order to see if someone's aging gracefully or not so much, which would it be? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's a little bit of a trick question because I think there, I would say in general of the methylation and other omics based clocks, those that are second and third generation, I'm happy to take a deeper dive at a follow-up show if needed, but these higher generation biomarkers are getting better and better. But if you ask me today, what the very, the most accurate for predictor of your future uh, health status. It's a combination of those type of things, but most of all, functional biomarkers, things like your capacity to, uh, your, 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 your strength, your capacity to run a certain distance. It's your ability to function. And there's ways to scientifically assess those in a way where you can compare yourself with others. Ultimately, it's gonna take more than one, but a composite of the general and the specific with these cutting edge aging biomarkers coupled with the traditional ones if we really want it to be most predictive for what we're interested in. Thank you so much, very exciting work. It's my pleasure, you. thank you for having me.